Good. One of you guys want to check this out real quick, just to make sure. Check LinkedIn, check YouTube, check Facebook, check the world to make sure that we are here. No, in all seriousness. Hey, this is Jim Gask with uh, No Law From Left Behind, back with No Law From Left Behind with my good friend DJ Meyer and Vinny Delval. Hi, guys. Hey, how's it going? What's going on, man? Dave, we should have went live like 30 seconds sooner than we did just to catch that last statement. That was pretty good. No. <laughs> you have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? That's your absolute just plain, just plain dumb, right? Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> Well, hey, everyone, let's get to business. Uh, we are here uh, at No Law Firm Left Behind to help your law firm be more competitive, uh, to keep your staff and attorneys more productive or productive, right, and efficient, and, uh, and to help you get clients calling. So uh, today, Dave, what is the pillar we're talking about today and the topic? I mean, it's a combination. We're going to focus on artificial intelligence within the context of productivity primarily. Okay. Okay. And Vinny, where does that fit in the, in, in the pillars of which, uh, you know, what would you say? Yeah. So the three pillars are keeping, keeping your firm competitive, um, keeping them productive and keeping your clients calling. I, I actually think it fits a little bit within all three, but primarily between the productive side. On the productive. No, I, think, I think Dave's got it. You know, I think, I think so. But, you know, here's the thing. I mean, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence. We're going to talk about how you can benefit from it. Uh, how you already use it and you don't even realize it, how you could use it. Mm -hmm. um, and these are things that really competitiveness, you know, yeah. I mean, if we, if we find tools that are, that are useful to ourselves, that help us be more efficient, that can lower our, lower our, our customers uh, wait times or, or bills or, or if, or, or affect our effectiveness for them and accuracy and, and, so on and so forth. That just makes us better attorneys, right? Not that I'm an attorney, Dave, you're the attorney in the group, right? But that just makes us better in general at what we do. We're not saying I'm a very good one. So no, uh, Jim, really you see, I, have, I have someone on LinkedIn saying there's no picture there. There's no picture on LinkedIn. Oh, man. Yeah, let's go. To, uh, you know what? I, I hate to move on without without actually being live. Hey, I'll put um, I'll put the YouTube channel on there. I'll go ahead and do that while you guys talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you guys could, uh, yeah. was that in a chat? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, Jill. Sorry about that. Um, Vinny's going to go ahead and put the YouTube channel in there just in case. Um, not really sure when we go live. We really don't have control over the platforms, so I'm really sorry if that is the case. I'm just going to pop over there, guys. Yeah, I got a I got a picture now at least. So. Uh, so, Jill, maybe uh, just give it a, a real quick open and close again and see what happens. Yep. So, um, it's live hey, on LinkedIn. What's that? It is live on LinkedIn. Okay, awesome. Uh, okay, great. great. Thanks, That's Jill. Good. Awesome. Thanks, Jill. We're happy. Thanks for watching it, Dave. And, uh, and so here's what we're going to talk about. Artificial intelligence, how a law firm can uh, – got a small law firm and a medium-sized law firm. Obviously, the large law guys, they're all, they're all in. As a matter of fact, they've made investments in artificial intelligence, right, Dave? That's right. Yep. I mean, some, of them, AI some, of them, some of them have strategic partnerships with some of the AI program, uh, some of the AI firms out there. But you know what we're seeing is is a bit more democratization at this point. Dave, could you give us just a real quick on on what we mean by by AI? Me and you kind of had a debate earlier today about AI, and I, I said the beginning is of, of AI was the old if then this that. You know, you take it take it to where well, we're let me, at. Let me, let me take it a step back. When you talk about the, the, the birth of AI, you know, one of the distinctions that I always draw between uh, AI is, is, is what it's not. And what AI is not is it's not just your traditional algorithmic approach to things, okay? It's a lot more than the if-then, okay? Remember that every if-then statement that gets written is written by a person. Right. Okay. And so if you've got a limitation in your if then, when you're writing it, that limitation is just there. Right. There's no expanding beyond it until someone goes in and changes the algorithm. And so artificial intelligence is really that next step in that evolution where it goes outside of the human generated rule set and starts developing its own set of rules, identifying its own patterns, identifying its own uh, similarities among things. And the way I always try to explain it to people is artificial intelligence. I, I could go into an incredibly in-depth discussion of what it is, you know, machine learning, blah, blah, blah. Nobody cares. Mm -hmm. 
Whenever I give a talk about AI, I always just explain to people, it is nothing more than glorified pattern matching. It's all it is, okay? It's the ability to take a set of data and saying, find me more stuff that's kind of like this. You know, tell me what this means based on everything else you know, computer mm -hmm. system. And so that's really the difference between algorithms that are the if-then approach and AI, machine learning, natural language understanding is it's going outside. You could put an if-then in there, but then based on everything else that the machine has in its data set, it can go beyond what you told it to look for. And so, say, you said this, but here's also this that you didn't think of. So when right. you're saying it's learning, it's adapting, right? It's Correct. adapting itself. It's not just what you originally put in there. It's constantly adapting itself uh, to, to either meet a need or, or to find more information that, that's out there. Right. And so what's nice about artificial intelligence is that it has capabilities far beyond what human intelligence does when it comes to um, sheer volume. So one of the first technologies that I'm going to that I'm going to talk about, and I'm not trying to jump the gun, but I'm going to reference Ross. OK, mm -hmm. yes, and Ross Intelligence is a legal research pr uh, platform that we're going to talk about a little bit later on. And it has the ability to analyze over a million pages of case uh, case law in per second. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when you're talking about a million pages per second, that's well beyond the ability for any of us to read and synthesize. Well, what does that mean? You know, we're talking about we live in an era with information explosion. We talk about how much data there is. Now, if we're approaching things the old way, what happens is we get overwhelmed with the sheer volume of data that's out there. We could never get through it. Well, what's amazing and awesome about artificial intelligence is that the larger the data set gets, the more accurate it gets. So mm -hmm. it has the ability to take this data explosion and use it as a strength rather than a weakness where when we're looking at things through our traditional lens. So that's really why AI is becoming more and more important is because the data is becoming more and more overwhelming. And if we don't have approaches like this, we're we're going to miss stuff. We're going to miss a lot of stuff. Right. Well, you know, before we get too deep into it, I want to pop over here and I want to share a uh, real quick uh, screen. This must be important to small law because Cosmolex wrote at least two different articles on it um, in the recent past, right? So here's one of them, right? And then, um, and we'll send these links out also, sorry, I didn't mean to pop over and lose that tab, but you know, they wrote two recent articles talking about, uh, talking about the importance of artificial intelligence. Now, I, I'm not sure the depths of which a Cosmolex uses AI in their product, but for crying out loud, you know, for even if they don't, the fact that they're actually talking about it speaks volumes, wouldn't you guys say? Yeah. Um, what has happened over the last several years is because I started doing presentations on AI probably early 2018, and we're closing it on 2021 now. All right. Might have been and, like that, Dave. You, you, I think you're underestimating. I think it was more like the beginning of 2017. It might have been. It all blends together at this point. Um, but when I started talking about AI, it was still predominantly the realm of large law. Yeah. It was expensive. It was challenging to implement in certain cases. Mm -hmm. It was challenging to get people to understand how to use it. Um, since then, we've seen an explosion of, uh, of you know, its its adoption within the small to mid sized law practice. Well, and it's and not even really law. seen over the last year, especially. A lot of small law has gotten in on this. Yeah, you know, and it's not just with legal applications. I mean, it's actually everybody that has a SaaS built application or everybody that has an on-premise built application is looking at and eyeballing, how can we build AI into our product? You know, mm -hmm. we're gonna talk about a couple in a minute, but it's not just like legal research, like you're saying, you know? Right. Um, if if a Cosmolex doesn't have AI built into it, and, and you know, I suspect that there's some with their, uh, with their functionality, where they call it the uh, profit profit uh, finder or something like that. They have a money finder. Yeah, what is it again? Money finder, the money finder. In the money finder, 
you know, I'm not sure if there's AI built into that or not, but it's the ability to actually say, hey, you know, you've got something here that looks like you can bill for, right? And so, listen, if that's not AI, that's still pretty freaking cool, right? Um, but if it's AI that goes a step further than cool, it goes, a, it really becomes somebody helping you with your business to make money. Right. You know, if AI can do that, that's a big deal. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and so let's talk about let's talk about this. I'm going to pop over here and I'm going to show um, something that we, we all probably take for granted. Now, I'm not going to I'm going to show you uh, 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 some screenshots. I'm not going to show you the actual uh, the actual um, the actual application. So this is a um, let me make it full screen. This is this is an email I get and I screenshot it and I redacted it. Sorry, I have to do that um, for the for the um, to protect the innocent. Right, guys. And so uh, every email in our Microsoft 365 and in many tenants, they have this. I think it's already rolled out to every tenant across the country. Um, this is called Cortana. This is an email that I get from Microsoft 365 to my my Outlook, okay, whether it's on my phone or my, my desktop. And it is it, call, it pulls together all of this stuff and says, hey, this sounds like to us, to me, Cortana, this is something you wanted to act on. So I sent an email yesterday to this guy at four o'clock. I'll call you at four o'clock, right? Well, you know, the idea of I'll call you is something that it picked up on and said, is that something that you need to do that you need to accomplish? And then not only does it, does it allow you to give you the chance to say, yeah, that's something I got to do, but yeah, I did that or I want to add it to my to-do list. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you know, this is pretty cool. You guys get this too, right? Yep. Now everybody can get this that has Microsoft 365. You can just turn it on and it helps you remember things. Again, it's trying to help you find things that you need to take care of. You know, I'll update, I'll update you by the end of the day. Mm-hmm. I'll talk, you know, all of these things are, look at this one, schedule a call and let me, this is just a statement more than anything else, right? Guys, it's not even a question, no question mark. Artificial intelligence, Cortana, which is Microsoft's version of, in Microsoft 365 of AI, realize that this is something that you you said you're going to do or somebody needs to do i think it's pretty cool what yeah. do you guys think? well i i've moved a, a, away from uh, email itself primarily as my communication tool for customers and i and i use ticketing more than anything else so i uh, don't use cortana on a daily basis like you do right right, right. um and so but I do find some of the information useful. I still review it to to see if there's anything that I'm missing, anything that I'm forgetting, uh, just to be sure. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I I find this interesting um, because, one, for a 12, even cheaper than that, a $12.50 month subscription to Microsoft 365, you've got a tool built into it that is based on artificial intelligence and then you know this is the simple stuff hey you know this is an ai this is you got a block of time in your calendar you can book time to to focus on things so dave i mean you know this is a simple this is a, do you think this is a simple ai or com, com, uh, complex ai so what all right <laughs> well, <laughs> here we go <laughs> i'm trying not to get nerdy okay and it's really hard for me when it comes to ai to, to not we know. do this we know. um He's been geeking out on AI for a bunch of years, guys. So basically, let's talk about, I I mentioned the glorified pattern matching concept. When it gets broken down into actual practical usage, um, the most common and base level use of AI is this natural language understanding. And through this natural language understanding, we have the ability to, to determine what are called, generally speaking, in intents. And the and I mean intent, like I intend to do something. And so what a lot of AI at its base level is focused on is taking a look at words, looking at language, whether it be typed, whether it be spoken, whether it be you know, whatever. And saying, all right, what does this person mean when they use this set of words? And so really the Cortana example that you're using here, Jim, is a perfect example of that. When you wrote in an email, I will call you tomorrow. It goes through, it reads everything and says, hey, 
the intention when you wrote this is that you were going to call this person. Now, whatever triggers take place based on that intent, that's where you get into your if then that you talked about earlier, Jim. Mm -hmm. If we identify an intent to call a person in an email, we're going to send a reminder the next day saying, hey, it seems like you intended to call this person. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody, but that, that's really sort of the base level. And what we're going to find out as we go through the other examples that I've got here today is a lot of it is still just intent based mm. analysis uh, of natural language. Okay. So I would say Cortana is a very, um, it, it is a basic level, but when I say basic, I don't mean simple. I mean, it, it is a application of one of the core purposes of AI. And I would say that this this example of, of Cortana is a small example because Microsoft's AI is much bigger than just oh, this. Yeah, Cortana is just one sample of their entire, uh, you know, language understanding mm -hmm. platform. And it's just one of many big ones that are out there right now. And you know, it's it's really it's really quite good. I use I use Microsoft's AI language understanding in a number of different applications myself. Um, I'm a big fan of their Q and A maker uh, technology, which can go out and create you know from FAQs chat bots that can answer questions for people with literally no programming necessary. It's just it's it's awesome stuff. Um, but it all really comes back to this concept of saying what does this mean? Okay. And as you get into some of the more advanced, and again, I don't say advanced as if it's more complicated, it's just building off of that. It's finding patterns that you that go beyond what you actually originally intended and saying, hey, you m had the intention of asking this, but we found other stuff that's kind of like what you're saying that you might want to be aware of. Okay, and that's where the machine learning aspect gets built on top of the um, natural language understanding aspect. Does that does that make sense? I mean, I, I hope no. I'm making it so it's kind of clear to understand. No, it's perfect. Okay, I get it. you want to you want to get to the behemoth one, the the most popular. Is that where you're going? I'm not sure exactly what you're. Yeah, you want to talk about Ross a little bit today? Okay, so I mean, if we're going to move into some of the technologies, there's you know a wealth of legal technologies out there that are based on this natural language understanding, pattern matching, machine learning tri triad, okay? We're only gonna have time to focus on a couple of them. And so what I've done is chosen two of the most common that are found in law practice. And they're among the, you know, some of the more well-known applications that are out there, platforms that are out there. Uh, the first one that I'm going to talk about is sort of the uh, the darling of the AI legal research world, and it's a company called Ross Intelligence. So, before we even go into sort of what Ross Intelligence pioneered, um, let's take a quick stroll down legal research, you know, memory lane. And we have a video for this somewhere, right? I don't have a video for this. It would be cool if I could. But, you know, if I if I had if I had the, you know, a video of people riding around on their on their, uh, you know, bicycles with the giant front wheels and all that stuff, we would start there. And that would be our old school books when we would do legal research and we would have to go through and we would have to, you know, look at an index and then go find cases and look at head notes and this, that, and the other thing. And it was tedious at best. And we were actually still learning all that when I was in law school is how to do the actual book research. But they were also starting to introduce the computer-based research as well. I mean, it was around, but it was starting to catch on. And so we had the Lexuses and the Wests and whatnot so, but when we did searching back then, it was our old school Boolean search. So that was your like Ford Model T um, sort of searching. And, you know, you had to really understand how to use your connectors and how to expand a search and how to limit a search and how to work with all this Boolean. And in fact, it was so much that most of the time you would have to reach out to the research 
provider and say, hey, here's what I'm actually looking for. Help me construct a search so that I can get the appropriate stuff back. And Mike, they, uh, no, we got a comment from uh, from Paige Beatum over here, Dave. Yeah. She goes, it's elementary, my dear, Watson. Ah, there you go. I love it. So what Paige, uh, what Paige is referencing there is, you know, we've, we've, we've talked about a couple of uses of the Microsoft AI platform. There are some other ones that are really big out there. The other really big one is uh, Watson, which is IBM. And it actually, uh, Watson is what powers Ross Intelligence and lots and lots and lots of other stuff. So um, that is an awesome little allusion there to one of the major AI players. So if we are still in our Ford Model T days, we noticed that, Jim, you made reference to your algorithm, okay, to your if then. This was a prime example of if you got your search wrong, you missed stuff. Mm -hmm. Or you got your search wrong, you got too much stuff. Mm -hmm. And so back in the Boolean days of research, we still had uh, the research was good it was quote unquote more efficient but it was still the realm of people that really were tech heads in order to actually make it work okay that evolved and then we started seeing the introduction of natural language understanding now natural language understanding the way that the legal research folks used to call it is not the same as natural language understanding the way that we see it today um, it was more we're going to take a, you know, you could put something in as a regular sentence instead of the Boolean, and it's just going to figure out, you know, oh, well, when you say this, you mean limit it to this year and and, and or, and, and it went through and it searched for similar phrasing. It's kind of like how we use Google in a way with natural language. You yeah, very much so. You go to Google to add in Boolean connectors if you want to, but nobody yeah. does because it doesn't, you don't need to. So that was sort of our transition period. OK, and that was the start of moving away from it being almost a data science approach to a everyday person, you know, accessible to the everyday person. All right. So what happens next? Well, you know, we've had natural language search for years. Now we move into the AI. And this is where Ross really changed the game, in my opinion. You know, the first thing that I mentioned is the sheer volume that it can go through at once it can it can process over a million pages of case law per second all right secondly what it does is instead of just looking at the natural language like in the past and saying hey here's stuff with similar phrasing similar keywords etc cetera, etc cetera, it's going to say all right when you put in this search term what do you mean what is the intent of that search term mm -hmm. and that's where if you think back to you know a couple minutes ago when i talked about natural language understanding that's one of the core tenets of AI is determining that intent from what you wrote. It then takes that intent, it creates all of the appropriate filters for you. It brings back the most relevant data set at that point. And it goes out and finds stuff that you might not have considered. So it says, you intended this. I'm going to go find other things that express a similar intent. All right. And these are things that you would um, this is these are things that you would miss if you were just doing looking for matching keywords, because you could have something that has the same legal thoughts, you know, the same legal concepts, but with none of the same words. OK, but the intentions match. Mm -hmm. And that only happens when you read things at a passage level. It's another big thing that Ross does differently. What it does is it goes through and instead of just looking at keywords at the smallest unit or looking at the case as a whole at the largest unit, it goes through passage by passage, sentence by sentence and says, what does this passage mean? What is this passage's implications? Hey, we can then once we look at this one particular passage, we can go out and find other cases that express the similar intent and return that in your search results, stuff that you would never think of finding. OK, and so by doing all this by looking at every single chunk within any of your search results it can expand to find things you would have missed but it will also limit and throw out things that don't match your intention even though it might share a lot of the same keywords 
Okay, so that's really how Ross has taken things. And Ross has been widely adopted among the large firms, you know, just a couple that, you know, they, they call reference to, they, they're being used by Latham Watkins, Denton's, Bacon Haas, Baker Hostetler, Jackson Lewis. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, they're not just the realm of big law anymore. They actually have plans available now for as little as $69 per month for like solo practitioners. So, I mean, in the grand scheme of legal research, that's dirt cheap. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. So it's not just big law anymore that accesses this. Um, I know we're coming up at towards 11 o'clock. I want to talk about Lexis, though, because they're another behemoth in the legal research world and they've done, they've gone through a number of um pretty significant acquisitions in the ai space and i i want to talk about a couple of things that they've purchased and how they've built that into their products two in particular one back in 2015 they purchased a platform called lex machina and that has been turned into what's now called lexus legal analytics and it has certain implications within certain uh, practice areas in particular. And what it does is it goes through and it, if you're researching a case or whatnot, it'll go through and, and, and find information about, you know, the judges, the courts that are related to your case. It'll review things like motions and whether they've been, motions are granted or denied. It shows timelines. It shows all that good stuff. It shows probabilities that your, a particular argument is going to be um, accepted or declined by a particular judge in a particular district in a particular court, I'm sorry, in a particular case type. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into Lex Machina. Um, the one that I find even more interesting than that, and I've got a couple screenshots that I'm going to share here. Uh, they, in 2017, they purchased a company called um, Ravel Law. And Ravel Law is been built into and rebranded as what's called Lexus Context. And what this is, is it's an AI based search functionality that covers judges, courts, experts, and other companies. Okay. And so what they are, what they have done is they've taken this AI approach to say, um, when you put in a particular judge, it's going to show you that judge, how often do they allow or deny a motion of different types? What judges, does this judge cite in their opinions? What cases does this judge cite in their opinions? What arguments does this judge favor? Okay, and it can do it at the judge level or at the court level. And so what this is able to do is go through and analyze all these data points and put together what's the intent. If you've got a case on a dog bite, you know, in dog bite cases in the sixth circuit which you know arguments are typically used most successfully for plaintiffs what arguments are typically used most successfully for defendants so it's gonna so so you're saying in, in this case huh pardon the pun um in a situation ai is gonna tell you the likelihood of your motion um succeeding or not the likelihood of the motion Mm -hmm. The likelihood of the motion based on the judge, based on the court, based on your opposing counsel. Maybe even it, telling you who you should cite potentially because this judge cites this this person more than others. You got it. If you can find, you know, if you've got two cases that both are citing the same principle, but this judge typically cites this particular judge, you're probably more likely to want to cite that same judge because you know that this judge looks more favorably upon opinions of that judge. Almost, it feels almost like cheating, but I mean, you know, in, in a way, I mean, it's a very strategic approach to things. And, you know, one other thing, and I just want to, if you could go ahead, yeah, I'm, I'm, I want to just kind of share real quick um, my screen, just so people can kind of see what this looks like. Because, you know, picture a thousand words kind of thing, right? So let me show this here. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we got it. Great. Yep. So I just want to show a couple of these real quick, okay? All right. So it has this visualization concept to everything. Um, let's say you have, and, and this is all pulled just from videos from Ravel as well as Lexus. And 
the idea is that you have your case or your search, right? And it shows you here is the court level on your Y axis. Here is the timeline on your X axis. Here is the case and the number of times it's cited determines how big its circle is. And here's the other cases that are referencing it as well as which direction citations are coming from. Mm. So you can very quickly visualize and find, all right, here's the real key cases in this particular search. So you'll see at the top here, scientific evidence, expert testimony. You know, we get Daubert, of course, um, and some of the other big ones. That's all well and good. What Lexis has done is they've taken that visualization approach and they have made it, if my screen will proceed, we have the ability here to go in and the, uh, they have example from the Ninth Circuit, William Alsop's, and here are different types of motions, how often they were granted, partially granted, denied. It links over to the decision language that applied when determining how to grant or deny that motion. It does it at the court level, like I said. And it shows you, so we'll go back to uh, uh, Judge Alsop here. What cases is Judge Alsop citing the most frequently, both the case itself as well as the judge? So you'll see, you know, mm -hmm. Rehnquist, O'Connor, Stevens, these are the ones that he's referencing the most. Sometimes he references himself. If you look about eight down there, he references himself quite a bit. So finally, and I just want to touch real quick, the expert, they also have an expert analysis. So a lot of times in tort cases and whatnot, you'll have, you'll know, you'll need to call on experts. They have the ability to go through and analyze, you know, experts in certain areas and how often their testimony was challenged, how often that challenge was admitted, admitted in part or excluded based on, you know, what what the challenge was based on. So methodology, qualification, relevance, procedural aspects and whatnot. So there's a lot of stuff out there. And like I said, I could talk and I've given talks for hours on um, AI. I just wanted to hit some of the some of the big guns here today. No, I think that's I think that's really good. I think that that visualization right there helped me out immensely. Okay. You yeah. Say no, he. I'm just chuckling. He says he can talk for hours. Oh, um, you know it. Come on. <laughs> I want to. I want to elaborate on it. He has talked for hours. I, I actually have. I actually have. I did a. Uh, well, see, he's going to talk for hours about me talking for hours. We just said I'm going to do that. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Really. Uh huh. That's kind of like my 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 lack of AI in your conversations, Dave. No, the visualization was great. You know that that. That uh, with what you showed there, you know, it, it isn't um, to me, that's competitiveness. I mean, to me that this falls right under competitiveness a little yep. bit more than productivity and efficiency. Yeah. It's going to save us time. You know, it's going to, it's going to make our results better, but guys, I hate to say it. I, I, I I'm all the way in the competitiveness column right now, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and so Dave, you know, thanks for that again. Every time you, you bring something onto the show, it's fantastic. It's always been done really well. By the way, everyone, Dave pulled this off in a matter of what, an hour, hour and a half, Benny? <laughs> like I said, well, I've, been, but, I, I've been doing it for years. I've been talking about this for years. Yeah. It's about packaging something that's relevant to our audience today. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was going to say. He, you know, he, we talked about it. Uh, last week, he, he already had it in mind and, and such. and Or actually, it was several weeks ago we talked mm -hmm. about it. And this is something that he's researched and that has a lot of knowledge in, in, in invested in this. So, Well, the, the one thing that you know, I always have to do whenever I give, uh, in particular, an AI presentation is I have to go through and make sure all the companies that I've referenced in my past slides are still there and still in business. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of them are very cutting edge. Some of them you know, some of them will fail, but more frequently they will get bought and gutted just for the programming expertise. And so mm -hmm. I, I always have to go back and double check and make sure, all right, I used to talk great about this company here. Do, do they still exist or did somebody buy them and gut them? You know, so right. that's what you always got to look for. Well, you know, Vinny, um, I, you know, I, can you second the uh, competitiveness or what do you think? No, I, for sure. You know, after seeing what he had, what he had there, as far as, you know, when you're going into a case, this is what you can use AI for. Absolutely competitiveness. Um, it, 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 a huge advantage over the uh, opposing parties if you have this. You so, know, 
Let me use AI every yeah. time. Our phones. Go ahead, Dave. I want to chime in because I want to point something out. Um, everything I showed today um, had a very litigation spin on it, mm -hmm. but it's only because I'm limited in time. There are a horde of AI-based platforms out there for your transactional and for your corporate and whatnot. Um, good example is there's entire NDA generation programs out there where you can take a non-disclosure and say, here's what I think our non-disclosure should read. And it will, you upload it to the system and it goes through and goes, hey, you should probably know that this language in this case, which is in your jurisdiction, has been shot down and lit, said, you know, it's not up, you know, it cannot be upheld, et cetera, et cetera. You might want to change it to say this instead. Mm -hmm. um, it has the ability to, um, for in-house, there are systems out there where you could have salespeople in the field, for example, that want to get a contract in front of a customer. Well, how do things work in the old days? I got to send it to legal, right? Mm -hmm. So they would submit it to legal and it would go through their AI based system. It would, it would do the immediate read, read through flag anything that looks problematic based on its machine learning algorithms. Only those things would go to legal for review and approval or review or, or, or rewarding. And so it increases that cadence speed across all kinds of different things. So, I mean, we focused on litigation, but like I said, I could talk for hours about this. There are so many applications, whether you're a litigator, whether you're transactional, whether you're a negotiator, um, whether you're in mediation, there's just so many things out there. Dave, I'm going to say this last thing and then we'll talk about next week's show and close up. Um, do you remember that video that you and I watched? You you showed it to me, the rock star video, the lawyer <laughs> rock star. <laughs> yes. But think I about that from an AI perspective. You want to mm -hmm. just kind of brush on on how that guy was a rock star. He met, not, might not have been a rock star anymore in that right. video. So, uh, you know, you back know. in the day, there was this awesome, I can't remember who made it. I'd be able to find it. But there was this whole little video about, you know, life as an attorney. And the new attorney. As yeah, a new as a new attorney. And basically, he was reading through this, like, you know, two, you know, this 150 page document. And he found a discrepancy between like, you know, it was $1 million and 38 cents on this page and $1 million and 34 cents on this other page. And like, he ended up being like the hero of the law firm and he was getting pats on the backs from the managing partner and being called a rock star for finding that error and this, that, and the other thing. And, and I can tell you from experience, when I graduated law school and I started as a new attorney, document review was huge. And I spent countless, countless, countless hours looking for a misplaced comma or looking for, hey, does this particular two word phrase exist in this contract anywhere? And we'd review hundreds of them, hundreds of contracts, flag all the ones that included these two words, okay? This was real, this is what we did. And think about how expensive that would be and how time consuming that would be. That guy would be not be uh, that big of a deal anymore because that discrepancy would be picked up in a matter of seconds. They're like, that's it. that happens all the time. We, we don't even have people do that anymore. Exactly, you know? and I mean, even the, I didn't even go into discovery, but there's a whole yeah, oh yeah. there's a whole world of AI based document review. Uh, a, AI is so I gave the example of Cortana. You gave the example of litigation. We gave the example of document review. AI is from the from the opening of your doors of a law firm, running the practice mm -hmm. all the way through to you know settling a case, negotiating a case, going to court, right? Mm -hmm. It, it can and does nowadays touch every aspect. And probably one of the things I, I would I think we should end on and we'll talk about next week. You should probably ask now what artificial intelligence your applications have built into them. Mm -hmm. okay. Tell us about your artificial intelligence, because if it doesn't, then they're probably not as competitive as somebody that has AI built into right. it. You know, it's a simple question. And, and I'd even go so far as, you know, from a tech perspective, from a technology company perspective, your consultants, what do you know about AI? You know, because the look, we're bringing this to you because it's a competitive tool, right? If they, if people don't bring this to you, then they're not being as competitive as they should. So enough said on that, guys. Hey, next week, we've got Virginia Holmes from uh, Coors and Bassett, right? Did you mm -hmm. put her up? She's all good to go. Ready for, ready for next week, Vinny? Yep. So she is the office manager of Coors and Basket here in Cincinnati. She's just a fantastic um, person. And, uh, and, and 
man. She knows how to run a law firm. And uh, Dave, you, you deal with her regularly for years. I've worked with Virginia for years. First of all, she's awesome. She is, you know, one of the nicest people that we work with, first mm-hmm. of all. Mm-hmm. Um, understanding, but still, I guess the right word's firm. Like she, she Good. really gets things done mm-hmm. for their firm. So I guess firm was like the worst word to use there. But, yeah. um, you know, she will not let things slip. She stays on top of things, both from a process perspective, as well as trying to stay on top of, you know, what's out there in, in the tech world. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear, you know, what Virginia has to share with us about how they've been handling things recently. Yeah, Vinny, they, they face some interesting things. Everybody has through COVID and, uh, and the quarantines. And I'm, I'm interested, they pulled off a pretty big project recently with their, uh, with their voice over IP um, conversion uh, and um, during COVID, anybody doing a project during COVID, especially a big one like that, they, they definitely need some applaud and we need to talk to them and find out what they're doing and why they're so successful. So that's next Tuesday, 1030 Eastern time on No Law Firm Left Behind. So guys, great job today. I really appreciate it. Hey, a couple of great comments. Um, if you're finding this video after the fact and you're not watching it live, that's that's fine. We appreciate you watching it, but be sure to hit the like button down below and make some comments because we respond to these things regularly. If you're not a member of the No Law Firm Left Behind group on LinkedIn, get over there and be a part of this. We put a lot of great content into that, uh, answer a lot of great questions and, uh, and, and push people in the right directions. Um, and in addition, if you haven't found our YouTube channel, Hop over to our YouTube channel, No Law From Left Behind, and you can find all our past videos as well as a whole bunch of other uh, technology, marketing, and business tips for law firms. So, guys, thanks a lot. All right. Appreciate it. Bye, everyone. All right. Take care, guys.